Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to an amazing weekday session. Today we're meeting on a Wednesday. I'm so excited for Surah Al Azab. This is a very heavy Surah. Um, Sheikh has been really burdened all night, all day, preparing for today. So I'm sure it's going to be extremely special. Um, it's amazing that now we've completed our 80th Surah. So this is our 81st. Um, and someone reminded me that we actually crossed our two-year mark, which is incredible because we started this whole project, Illumin Journey, in June of 2020, at the end of June 2020, um, in a different state. So, and then we made it here, that made our own hijra, um, and have worked really hard to make our way all the way through, you know, Surah Noor this last time, which was so um, life transforming and I think that you know for anyone who's been with us on this journey you know two years is a really long time to be really committed to studying the Quran and it's really powerful to even look back at where we were um, how we felt like when I go back and I look at some of these old videos and just imagine where we were first of all it feels like a blink of an eye ago so it's really hard to believe that it's been two years but even just the feeling of like seeing us in our space in Los Angeles and what we were talking about and where we were and just you know where what our headspace was and where, you know, where we've come in this last two years, it's really, really incredible and even more so that we've captured it, you know, on, on YouTube, on these videos. It's, um, I, I, sometimes I think this is really um, a, just a stunning journey that we were able to, to capture all of this learning and hopefully it'll be here for many, many years to come um, to benefit people, you know, who are just discovering us even now or have not yet even discovered us. Um, but I keep getting messages from people who have said that this is such, uh, an incredible journey, incredible learning, um, and you know, part of our challenge is just conveying to people that the Quran has something very special and very powerful that's very relevant for our day and age. Um, and so, I just pray that more people will find it and that um, they will find it, you know, when they need it the most. Um, we have a couple of really cool um, excerpts that we just released. One is on um, the sin of Hajj where from the last Q uh, session on um, Saturday where, where Sheikh was discussing um, really how he arrived at sort of the last straw, what made him finally feel comfortable saying that given the circumstances now that um, giving money to the people who are effectively in charge of Hajj is a sin. Um, and so, you know, this is obviously a very, you know, controversial, powerful statement, but I think the response to the video has been um, extremely positive and telling and if nothing else it's not like someone just coming out online and saying something you know where you could accuse them of trying to get attention or whatever but this is a really powerful um, excerpt that I hope people will share because a lot of times you know as we know people don't have time to watch um, you know long halakhas but this gives people a sense of you know the power of this learning and how it is relevant to what we're happen what's happening to us today in 2020 um, also, we just released um, an excerpt on modesty, um, hijab, himar, and social media, um, which again is, you know, again, the power of this learning um, for our day and age and what makes us really think about how we are choosing to live our life with the challenges that we face and what we as Muslims can do to bring light to the situation. Um, and, you know, it's an important, um, you know, it's an important introspection for all of us. Um, and, you know, like I, I often say, you know, I love the fact that what we are learning is so apropos for whatever is happening in the world. We know that this past weekend, um, again, we have had this devastating mass shooting in Chicago, which is not very far from where we are. Um, seven people were, were killed, 30 people were injured in a July 4th um, parade. This was um, in a largely, a predominantly Jewish affluent neighborhood outside um, of Chicago in a, in a suburb. And so you can imagine a lot of people just went hoping to have a very pleasant day with their families and it ended up being a massacre and that I even read articles about how people quickly covered the bodies because they didn't want people to see what can be done to a human body. Uh, you know, when you're using a high-powered weapon that really is not meant for anything but war, and even it's probably questionable whether this is even necessary for war. Um, and at the same time, another story about how another black man was shot down um, in Akron, Ohio, um, again, very close by to where we are. His name is Jalen Wa Walker. He pulled over for a traffic violation, ended up getting shot 60 plus times. It's another one of these really horrific stories. Um, and, you know, it made us turn to, um, you know, uh, this resource that actually Sharif discovered, and I wanted to just share with people 
because I feel like the media is not doing a very good job of really communicating the seriousness of this gun um, epidemic. There's a website called gunviolencearchive.org, and they've been around since 2013, and they are trying to basically um, keep track um, in a very objective way of all of the incidents of gun violence. So it's a situation where people have been killed, people have been injured, um, and they have all kinds of, you know, really devastating statistics, um, and it's, you know, an important um, piece of information for the, the conversation about, you know, gun control, um, which we also know with the recent Supreme Court decision um, really hampers the ability um, at many levels to, to restrict access to guns. But just to give you um, a sense, um, you know, they have actually a link on that website where you can just look at what's happened in the last 72 hours. So <clears throat> today is July 6th, right? So as of 5 p.m., they had reported 14 of these incidents. But July 5th, 145, and July 4th, 221 gun incidents where people were killed or injured. And these are things that we obviously don't get a feel of just by looking at the media. We hear about mass shootings, we hear about the real extreme cases. But if you understood that just on July 4th, there were 221 incidents that were reported in the news somewhere around the country about something that happened to someone at the hands of a gun, you know, someone with a gun, that, that's a devastating number. Now multiply that times, you know, the entire year and then every single year that they've been tracking it since 2013 and I'm sure it's, it's an incredible number. So I just became aware of this website. There's so much there. Um, but, you know, it's important for us as Muslims, obviously, you know, when we put this together and we say, okay, how do we bring light to our community? How do we um, take on causes that are really relevant to us because we could be the ones that are sitting at a, you know, a parade or a, you know, any kind of event out in the open. We could be at a bookstore, we could be at the grocery store, I mean anywhere, and we could fall victim to gun violence. So what can we as Muslims do to, you know, help this situation and bring light to this situation? Well, number one, we should educate ourselves and be aware of the resources that are available to us so we can become more you know, powerful and um, effective advocates for change. Um, and, you know, just, you know, if we think about Islamophobia and the, the obvious um, implications of that, you know, if this was a Jewish, affluent Jewish neighborhood that was targeted, and what's not to say that as things get worse, we as Muslims become targeted in our own space here in America. We know that's happening all around the world. And even there was a shooting in Copenhagen over the weekend, and the shooter was a white male, but I was struck by the fact that reporting on it, they used the words terrorism, and they used shooting at a mall, and the picture they used was a woman in hijab, which conveyed to people that it was probably a hijabi woman that committed the crime, but as it turns out, if you actually read it, this shooter was targeting people who looked like they were Muslim. So she was a victim. She was not an aggressor. She was not the shooter. But you wouldn't know that by the way the media treats these kinds of stories. So again, this is um, you know how important it is for for we as Muslims not you know to think about how do we live our faith is by making a difference, by bringing light, by being active, um, you know, by getting involved in you know gun regulation or whatever. If this is something you know politics, this is something that is important for us to to think about moving forward. So I just wanted to share all of that with you. Um, you know, again, I'm so excited. Like with every Sora, we just we learn so much more, um, and you know, about how we, as individuals, as one person, can make a huge difference. And I'm so excited to know what this heavy Sora Al Azab has for us, because Sheikh mentioned that there is a connection with Sora Noor, so it made some sense to him that this would be the next Sora. So I'm so excited. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to an amazing session. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وأشرف الصلاة والتسليم على محمد خاتم الرسل والأنبياء أجمعين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الأطهار الميامين وعلى أصحابه المختارين وعلى من اتبعوا بإحسان إلى يوم الدين الله مشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الوقدة من لساني يفقه قولي يا رب العالمين سورة الأحزاب um, is going to present us with a number of 
uh, interpretive challenges. It's um, and I hope that I'll be uh, I'll present the material in a sufficiently organized fashion so that we can avoid confusion. Now, from the outstart, we, it's one of these sort of where, where we uh, confront um, a chronological challenge. Uh, there are reports that say that Surat al-Ahzab was revealed um, after al-Baqarah, al-Anfal, and al-Umran. The reports claim that it is al-Baqarah, al-Anfal, al-Umran, and then al-Ahzab was revealed. And if so, then Al-Ahzab would have been revealed before Surah An-Nisa. It would definitely been have revealed before Surah Al-Hashr and before Surah Al-Nur. Um, leave alone many other surah, such as uh, Al-Mujadala or, or Al-Hujurat, Al-Saf, al Jum'ah, and so on. But for reasons that I think will become obvious, this chronology is very unlikely. Um, this chronology is very unlikely. Uh, it is nearly certain that Surat al-Ahzab is revealed after Surat al-Nur, for instance, not before and also after Surat Al-Hashr, and not before. Um, again, also the evidence is that it's revealed after Surat Al-Nisa, and not before. So, as we'll see, Surat Al-Ahzab, at the heart of Surat Al-Ahzab, is a historical event that helps us situate the surah um, with some complications that we'll talk about. And all indications, I mean, it is, I think, fairly clear um, that Surah Al-Ahzab must have been revealed very close to Surah Al-Nur, although after Surah Al-Nur, but closely after. Um, and that it was revealed in the fifth year Hijra with an intriguing question mark as to a segment of Surah Al-Ahzab whether it was revealed, whether that segment was revealed in the seventh uh, year of the Hijra, in other words, you know, a few years, years later, but then all of the surah was consolidated as Surat al ahzab But we'll come to that, um, and we'll talk about whether, in fact, it is likely that the brunt of the surah was revealed in the fifth, cent, uh, fifth year of Hijra, and a part revealed a, a bit later in the seventh, or whether in fact it was just all revealed in the fifth um, Hijra. Okay. The historical event 
the Surat al Ahzab addresses is what is known as the Battle of the Trench, Ghazwat al Khandaq. Um, the, the very name, the Ahzab or the Confederates, it alludes to this historical event when an alliance of Confederate tribes, various tribes around Medina, um, struck an alliance to wage a unified invasion against Medina with a formidable force. Um, estimates are that about 12,000 to 15,000 men um, with Quraysh leading the alliance but successfully marshalling a number of tribes to attack Medina all at one time. And although you would uh, read in historical texts that while the Confederates were about 15, 12 to 15,000 uh, men, uh, you read in historical sources that Muslims were, the, the Islamic force confronting the Confederates were about two to 3,000 men. But as we will see, the reality, though, is that Muslim forces confronting the Confederate invasion was actually significantly smaller than that, smaller than even two or 3,000. Um, because of the events that unfold around the Battle of the Trench. And the Battle of the Trench marks a very significant point in um, the development of the Islamic message in Arabia. The fact that this invasion failed, the failure of this invasion seemed to have been uh, a major psychological victory for Muslims. Um, the Arab tribes opposed to Medina lost their fighting spirit after their battle of the trench. And in fact, Muslims moved from largely defensive postures to a posture where they were initiating um, in the ongoing war between them and these various tribes, Muslims after the Battle of the Trench took the initiative far more often um, than before the Battle of the Trench. And it is fair to say that Quraysh wasn't able to marshal the same type of alliance um, uh, it, it just, it was a major political, ideological, uh, moral blow um, to Quraysh. And so the events turned out to have an enormous historical significance and turned out to be a major turning point in early Islamic history.
אוקיי. So we know that the, at the heart of the surah is this major crisis that Muslim confronted, a unified, consolidated invasion by a vastly superior force. And we need to keep this in mind as we go through what Surat al-Ahzab chooses to talk about under the circumstances. Because this, if we are trying to understand what I often called in, in my, in my uh, writings and my scholarship, the authorial enterprise, Authorial enterprise meaning all the things that the author of a text is trying to achieve. That the, the layers of meaning that are communicated through not just the words, but the structure of the text, the organization of the text, um, the tonality of the text, and the context of the text, and an attempt to fully understand the sort of the trajectory of this text, what, what, where this text is going, where this text wants to go, is what I've referred to as the authorial enterprise in scholarship that I've written in the past. So it is important in, in, in if we want to understand the authorial enterprise, we, we, it's important to keep in mind that at the heart of the events that Surat al-Ahzab is talking about is this major crisis that Muslims confronted, the a major siege by a unified, superior unified force. Um, and Arabia historically has not been good about Arab tribes unifying in a common goal. In fact, one of the, of the things that had plagued Arabia throughout its history is that Arab tribes are constantly uh, engaged in feuding with one another. They are con constant feuds among Arabs. And uh, around the birth of the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, was the last time that there was a major alliance between Arab tribes. And in that situation, Arab tribes came together to, uh, it was unrelated to Islam, um, for a common cause in what was known as Hizb al Fudul. I mean, it, it's, uh, but so it, it's, a, it's a rather s significant event that Arab tribes managed to unite against Muslims in Medina to the extent that they did, and to raise this fairly huge force um, to destroy Islam once and for all. Because the next time that Arabs will be able to unite like this in, uh, is under the umbrella of Islam. So w once they've, they've lost their fighting spirit, because they were defeated in the Battle of the Trench, they actually weren't able to come together again, except under the umbrella of Islam. Which is, again, we'll, we'll see is, is rather interesting. Now, it is 
also interesting that we are covering Surah Al-Ahzab right after Surah Al-Nur. Because there is there are commonalities between the two sore. In some ways, and this is my opinion, Surah Al Ahzab is like um, a second chapter to Surah Al Nur, as we will see. It is if you are studying Surah Al Nur and if you internalize the message of Surah Al Nur, Surah Al Ahzab takes you to a more, how do I say, it? Um, it's as if it, it takes you into an evolutionary step. So if you've got Surah Al Nur in your background, then Surah Al Ahzab evolves the message to a further refinement and a further critical point. Although you don't find that in the Tafsir literature, none of the Tafsir literature talk about this. But I think as Inshallah, we'll see. I think it's undeniable, um, and for many different reasons. And um, yeah. Anyway, we'll, so we'll, we'll come back to this because it's there is a, a lot of things that connect to it. Okay, so I'm going to start by actually commenting about the structure of Surah Al-Ahzab. Um, because keeping in mind the structure, I think, will be very helpful in being able to to comprehend and internalize the message of Surah Al-Ahzab. So Surah Al-Ahzab starts out with a message that is deceptively mundane. Allah starts out by telling the Prophet Ittaqillah. Now, fear God. And, you know, it's, it's people easily pass over this point. But I'll come back to it. Then, it, after addressing itself to the Prophet والسلام, and sort of getting the attention of the Prophet والسلام, and getting his attention about what? It's getting his attention about the indeterminacy and the weak constitution of so many human beings that human beings are masters of indeterminacy and self-deception. that 
the reality that human beings construct is often an absolutely false reality, self-sovereign reality. So much so, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this, in the expression that Allah says, God has not given, God has not placed in the human chest two hearts. Now, this is actually turns out to be very significant for the message of Surah Al-Ahzab. That human beings, and we'll, 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 we'll talk about this, that metaphor of two hearts in a single chest tells us a lot about the way human beings construct reality. And it starts out with a legal problem that we've already encountered in Surah Al-Mujadala. And that is the problem or the legal problem of Zihar, where a person makes a declaration that such and such person is like their mother to them. But from there, it moves on to talk about the nature of family relations, particularly the status of adopted children. And as it moves on then to talk also about the way human beings reacted to an enormous challenge which happens to be the challenge of the siege. But reminiscent of Surah An-Nur as it engages this issue of the challenge of the siege and what people have done, did when confronted with this challenge, it moves on to addressing a number of ethical questions surrounding first the Prophet ﷺ and his family and his place in society and then other ethical issues that have to do with modesty and social morality. But in the course of doing so, it tells us that the Prophet ﷺ is the prophet, the prophet self, and Alil Bayt are Siraj Munir. They are a luminous guide. So drawing our attention to the notion of light, but here the light is embodied in the person of the Prophet ﷺ. And it tells us this in the context, as we will see, of a number of um, derisive things unflattering things, unflattering accusations leveled against the Prophet ﷺ. While in Surah An-Nur, 
it was talking about a member of the family of the Prophet. Here it comes to the person of the Prophet telling us this is an old story. This is something that Mo from the M Moses was exposed to, prophet after prophet was exposed to. But as we will see, it, 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 it addresses this thing, or it makes this point about historical events that it is fair to say are not resolvable. And we'll see why this is very significant. So Allah knows that there are going to be things about history that we can't resolve. We will never have an answer to. We can pretend to have an answer to, but anyone that looks at these historical events deeply will in fact not have an answer. And yet tells us that if you want to understand, you have to understand that this prophet, the moral role of this prophet, not the historical role, the moral role, is that this is a luminous center. But then comes to deliver something astounding at the very end. And that is the concept of the amana, the trust that Allah metaphorically offered, could have offered the trust to all types of things, but it is only human beings who carried this amana on earth, not in the universe, but on earth. And so it then puts you squarely before the question of what is this amana? What is the relationship between the amana and the beginning of Surah Al-Ahzab? What is the relationship between the amana and what Surah Al-Ahzab says about human beings having more than one heart in their chest? What is the relationship between the amana and the Prophet ﷺ being a Siraj Munir or as if a, a luminous example? What is the relationship between amana and what Surat Al-Ahzab tells us about social ethics? And what Surat Al-Ahzab tells us about the way that we react to overwhelming challenges. Because it is precisely then when Surat Al-Ahzab takes you to the theme of the Amana, then Surat Al-Ahzab ends. And if you get the sense that what Surat Al-Ahzab is delivering is a very weighty message for those who have comprehension, then you would be absolutely correct. It is not, as we've seen with Surah Al-Ahzab, and we'll talk about this in a second, as some have tried to water down the impact of Surah Al-Ahzab by oddly enough impeaching 
impeaching the integrity of Surat al-Ahzab itself. We have to understand that contrary to what we, tradition is important, but tradition always, because it is so important, it is often becomes the target of those who are opposed or hostile to this tradition. And I strongly suspect that because of the message of Surat al-Ahzab, precisely because of the message of Surat al-Ahzab, it became squarely the target of those who wanted to create questions about the integrity of Surat al-Ahzab. So let's start out with this question of, or this issue rather, of the integrity. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the most remarkable things about Surat al-Ahzab is that you read reports um, from uh, Abi bin Kaab, uh, Ubay bin Kaab. Ubay bin Kaab says, or is reported to have said, that Surat al-Ahzab was the length of Surat al-Baqarah but that when the Quran of Uthman was written, all that survived of Surat al-Ahzab is what we have today. Similarly, similarly, there is a report attributed to Aisha that Surat al-Ahzab used to be 200 verses, but that after Uthman finalized the copy of the Quran, it shrunk from 200 verses to 70-something verses. We have other reports Um, that even get to, to, to the border on the, the, the really ridiculous, that Surat al-Ahzab used to be much longer and that there was a copy of Surat al-Ahzab in, in the full length of Surat al-Ahzab in Aisha's home but then the, the, these documents were eaten by chickens or eaten by lice or eaten depending on, on the, you know, you get different versions. You even have reports that Omar attributed to Omar where he says, oh, Surat al-Ahzab used to have a stoning verse, but somehow that stoning verse disappeared from the written copy of the Quran and so on and so forth. What do we make of all these reports that claim Surat al-Ahzab was longer, 200 verses, that had the verses of stoning, etc., etc. And uh, so what the import of this is that the Surat al-Ahzab that we have today is, is not the complete thing. Now, 
when you look into these traditions, which of course is a favorite, these types of traditions are favorites for so many Orientalists and Islamophobes. Um, because they're all they're they're in regular Islamic sources. I mean, they're not hard to find. They're they're not obscure sources or anything like that. Um, when you look into the transmission of these narratives, again, you're struck by. In, in this case, not persons that converted to Islam of questionable faith. In other words, people who uh, were, we have suspicions that they were remained Christian or remained Jewish or remained Zoroastrian or remained Sabians and, and, and converted to Islam but seem to transmit a lot of traditions that are very close to biblical traditions or very close to Talmudic traditions or very close to Zoroastrian traditions. No, in, so in the case of Surat al-Ahzab, these tran transmissions have individuals that come from two distinct orientations. Orientations that are opposed to the role of Al al -Bayt. So pro-Umayyad, pro Qurayshi pro transmitters who under, who, in being strong supporters of the Umayyads, it, it was if you were a strong supporter of the Umayyads, what the Umayyads were locked, the, the conflict the Umayyads were locked into was a struggle with Ali al -Bayt. And so at the heart of this, they are aware that Surah Al-Ahzab talks about the role of Ali al-Bayt and the role of Muhammad as Suraj Munir. And if we ever mature intellectually enough, we, if we grow up, which Allah Anna when will happen if ever, If we grow up, we would realize that there were people who were very aware of the risk inherent in the moral example of the Prophet. They wanted people to understand the Sunnah of the Prophet as imitating the Prophet's beard, imitating the Prophet's Jalabiyyah, imitating the Prophet's Miswak, but not being inspired by the ethical example of the Prophet, because as we will see, that poses a serious challenge politically. And those individuals repeatedly displayed a pattern of raising or of creating um, um, curveballs, creating difficulties, obstacles to the type of narratives that would center the Prophet والسلام, as an ex ethical example rather than a legalistic example. To put it simply, 
it's one thing if you want to imitate the Prophet in cleaning your teeth with miswak. But it is completely a different thing if you are going to start saying, no, I want to follow the example of the Prophet in terms of how he, he how, what type of policies he adopted towards people who were poor in society. One is safe, one is not very safe. So that's one thing. The other thing is the, the first orientation that I said from the transmitters of those who question the integrity of Surah Al Ahzab is, as I said, pro Umayyad, anti Ali Bayt. But the second, there was a powerful political orientation in early Islam that had a rather strong influence at various stages of Islam that was fatalistic in nature, that believed that Allah creates both good and evil and Allah creates human beings from inception, from the moment of creation, who are going to go to heaven and people who are going to go to hell. That everything is predestined. And of course, you I don't think it would surprise you that that theological orientation tended to be uh, 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 dictators or uh, uh, despotic governments loved the theological orientation because it always preached obedience. That you, you don't oppose anything, you don't object to anything, you don't object because all injustice is God's will, all despots are God's will. In fact, trying to change anything is seen as against God's will. And that theological orientation absolutely did not like the idea of amana, which we will talk about, that the end of Surah Al-Ahzab talks about, as the trust of free will, choice, or intellect. And a very effective response was to say, well, we can't talk about Surah Al-Ahzab because you know what? The Surah Al-Ahzab that reached us, it's incomplete. So don't talk to me about al Bayt and Siraj Munir and, and the amana, the trust that Allah as free choice or intellect or so on. Because, you know, if you would have read the entire Surah Al-Ahzab, you would know that all your ideas are wrong. Well, where is that entire Surah Al-Ahzab? Oh, well, it's lost. Well, how could it be lost when there were so many companions at the time who had memorized the Quran and at least parts of that lost text of Surah Al-Ahzab would have been communicated. Some companion would have said, well, let me recite to you 20 verses that used to be in Surah Al-Ahzab. Or I'd say, the answer was, oh, well, all the people that used to know what Surah Al-Ahzab, the full Surah Al-Ahzab, well, they died in the Hurub al -Ridda. They were all killed in the time during the time of Abu Bakr in the uh, Ridda battles, in the wars, apostasy wars. And so, you know, by the time when Uthman then collected the, the, the Surah Al-Ahzab, no one was around that remembered the rest. Well, even someone like Ali, who was around, didn't, we have nothing from Ali. Oh, well, you know, Ali didn't want to say because Ali didn't want to embarrass Osman. 
okay, someone like Omar, because all we have from Omar is that this tradition that says, oh, the stoning verse used to be there, but how about all the rest that you say was suppressed? Oh, well, you know, he didn't want to oppose Osman either, or he didn't want to clash with, you know, you get into very incoherent responses. But when you see something like that in the tradition, I mean, you, you could be an idiot, and there are, alhamdulillah, there are tons of idiots around. And you read an Orientalist that says, oh, see, you know, proof, the Quran is fake. You know, look, there are people who say Surah Al-Ahzab used to be blah, 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 and so on. Or, you know, like some Muslims, you know, read an Islamophobic text, oh, well, you know, positive proof that the Quran is, you know, look, the, this tradition, or you can actually do your homework instead of just being, you know, a, a, a whining moron, and you can actually do your homework and investigate and study and look into these traditions and look at who transmitted these traditions and look at where these traditions emerged, how they developed, who, what were the versions that were reported, and then you would get a historical insight into what was animating these traditions that are saying something that doesn't make sense. It's not, it's, you know, it's not telling us, well, you know, as the qira'at, well, instead of this word, it was this word, or, you know, that we have a proposition missing here. No, it's telling us that this surah, somehow, Half of it was just poof, gone. And of course, then when you do your homework, you discover, ah, okay, well, yeah, I see. They, these people, the way they weaponized these traditions is to say, don't cite to me Surah Al-Ahzab about the intellect or the trust. Don't cite to me Surah Al-Ahzab about Ali al-Bayt. Don't cite to me Surah Al-Ahzab about Suraj Muriyah because this surah is, is incomplete. People, and as we will see, people, unfortunately, what Surah Al-Ahzab has to tell us, the irony, the irony is that Surah Al-Ahzab itself warns against the extent to which people are willing to corrupt their most sacred of things just to cater to their whim, including the Quran. People will defend their pride even if it's the cost, is corrupting the Quran itself. People will stand and defend their ego and their pride, even if the cost is maligning a little bit. I'll jump ahead a little bit and give you just a, a, a quick example that might... Um, Um, there is a mountain There is a mountain in Medina called Silla. This mountain played a very important role, very important role in the Battle of the Trench, as we will talk about, inshallah, in a bit. 
this mountain Sina is just it's it's a mountain close to Medina, about um, a few kilometers outside of Medina, and it, it played a very important historical role in the Battle of the Trench. And not only that, but at this mountain is a mosque that the Prophet built in 1900. At the time of the Battle of the Trench, it, that mosque was constructed because at the at the location or in the spot where the Prophet ﷺ during the Battle of the Trench would spend hours praying and supplicating and begging God um, for for help, but. Also, at the same area, there's a, another mosque for Imam Ali, radiallahu an, and for Fatima al-Zahra, and a mosque for Salman al-Farisi, and a mosque for Omar, and a mosque for Abu Bakr. So, a mosque built by the Prophet, or uh, where the Prophet, والسلام, used to pray at the Battle of the Trench, and a mosque built where Salman al farsi used to be pray, where Ali used to pray, where Fatima used to pray, where Abu Bakr used to pray, and where Omar used to pray. Uh, all in around the events of the Battle of the Trench. Most of these mosques have been destroyed. The mosque built by the Prophet ﷺ the last I've checked is that it still stands. But what is shocking is that various people throughout recent history, since the 60s, have been trying to raise that mountain to the ground so that they can build apartments and other developmental projects. So they've been, basically, they, 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 they bulldoze, bulldozing and flattening a part of the mountain of Silla just so they can profit. And I was looking, they, they, the, the various companies that have come up with these projects go to Shiyuch, that they hire to petition the Saudi government to allow them to destroy Mountain of Silla so they can do their developmental projects. And the Shiyukh provide theological arguments why it is okay to destroy the Mountain of Silla. And I've been looking at the, the theological arguments and I Thought, and I think myself, subhanAllah, that this is made in the context of the mountain that played such a role, important role in the Battle of the Trench. Because if people understood what Surat al Ahzab is about, because Surat al Ahzab exactly warns us about the ability of human beings. to embrace corruption and convince themselves of anything. And we'll come to that in, in more detail as we talk about the Battle of the Trench, inshallah. What time is it? Okay, so all of this was by way of introduction and setting up 
سورة الأحزاب. Um, and then inshallah we'll, we'll begin. Um, let's take three minutes and then we'll, we'll start. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The opening of Surah Al-Ahzab Ya ayyuhal nabi Ittaqi Allah Wa la tuti' al-kafirin Wa al-munafiqin Inna Allah kan aliman hakima Wa attabi' ma yuha ilayka min rabbik Inna Allah kan bima ta'amaluna khabira وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا The series of injunctions Now, so striking it starts out saying this prophet addressing itself to the prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام Ittaqillah. Ittaqillah is, which is a, a common, has become a common mode of expression. We say, fear God. Be conscious of God. Be God-fearing. Now, we pass over this, but to be the recipient of that instruction requires a considerable amount of humility. Because first, imagine if you go to any ruler today, and you say that simple statement, ittaqillah, you, you'll be in, in most Muslim countries, unfortunately, you, you'll be thrown in prison right away. You, you know, there was a man famously who met Mubarak at the Kaaba, an Egyptian guy, and he just told, said to Mubarak nothing more than ittaqillah. Saudi Arabia arrested him, extradited him to Egypt where he was thrown in prison for 20 years and then died. Just for saying to Mubarak these words, ittaqillah. But even most people, most Muslims, if you told them ittaqillah, fear God, they immediately go on the defensive. You know, whether it's who are you to be telling me to fear God, or you know, some type of, but re remarkably, is when, as we said, everything in the Quran is demonstratively for us. When, when the dynamic of this text is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts out by saying to the Prophet والسلام, fear God and we know that the Prophet is not has no intention I mean it's not like the Prophet wants to obey a kafirin, those who the unbelievers and al-munafiqeen, the hypocrites. But yet, although the Prophet can very fairly say and reasonably say, I have no intention of following what they're telling me. But yet Allah is telling the Prophet exactly that. Fear God and be vigilant in not allowing yourself to follow them. Well, any reasonable reader would say, well, obviously Allah is not talking about 
the the Allah is not trying to imply that the Prophet has an intent to follow a kafirin wal munafiqin, but Allah is talking about influence. It's like saying, be vigilant in not allowing yourself to be influenced by those who have no intent of deliberately following the straight path. And notice in each of these, Allah emphasizes that Allah is Alim Hakim. Allah bima ta'amaluna khabir. Allah knows all. Allah knows what you're doing. Allah, in fact, is, is sufficient, your sufficient reference point and your sufficient support. So, your emotional, your psychological, your intellectual reliance should be fully on Allah. And then, this is immediately followed by مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ So, this first statement, Allah has not given, uh, Allah doesn't, or no human beings have been given two hearts. And of course that again is metaphorical. We have reports, again, they're, they're, they are claimed as reasons for revelation, but I think that they're more incidental to revelation more than causes for revelation. We have reports that um, a very common statement among those that can be described as hypocrites in Medina that will play a, you know, we already saw what role they played in the Banu Nadir. We already saw what Play the role, what role they played was Banu Mustalaq and the whole incident was Hadith al Ifq. But here we're going to see further what this lack of resolve and lack of will and lack of determination can do to a human being. And we have these reports that say that what had become current among uh, people of weak faith, commonly referred to as the hypocrites, is that they would they they would um, say, well, you know, I'm of two hearts on the matter of the prophet. On the one hand, one heart one heart tells me um, to be loyal to the prophet and to do X, Y, Z, the right things. But my other heart tells me to be cautious and to be wary and not to fully commit. We have other reports in which gives you sort of a picture of the intense pressure that the prophet ﷺ lived with. These reports say that there was a morning where during Fajr prayer, the Prophet made a mistake in prayer. We're not told, most of these reports don't tell us what the mistake was, but that there was some error in prayer. The, the type of error where, you know, it commonly happens and you say Allahu Akbar to alert the, the Imam that they've made a mistake. And that 
upon the commission of that simple error, the again the group of people that the, became known as the hypocrites, they were there praying in with the prophet, but they went around saying, "Well, you know, look, it's obvious that he is not what we thought he is." He, he's not fully concentrated in prayer. Um, if he did, it's sort of like impeaching his character by setting a standard that is superhuman. That as if, if he was a true prophet, he would, his mind would never drift and he would never make a mistake. Which, if you think about it, is actually a very, very human thing to do. That although when you are too weak to commit yourself to what you know is right, then you adopt a standard that you yourself cannot follow and and then apply that standard to whoever is making you feel guilty. Whether it's a teacher or whether it's a moral example or whether it's a whoever. But these are people that have a track record of being weak individuals. And yet, seeing an, an one error committed by the prophet, they were immediately started pontificating about the implications of that error. Now, I don't believe that these were occasions for revelations. I, I believe that these were incidents that um, that later interpreters saw as fitting what the Quran said about two hearts. And they said, well, these must have been occasions for revelations. Anyway, so keep this in mind that we start out with saying, with Allah saying, this pass. And by this point, it shouldn't surprise us. This path requires a commitment and a determination and a resolve, a seriousness, and a humility which cannot entertain. It's in the same way that you cannot entertain two hearts in your chest cannot entertain a divided will. What, what, are, what is two hearts? It's a basically a divided will, a will that says, well, I want to please God, but I am not sure I am, can forego all the things that I need to forego. I want to worship God, but I'm not sure that I can stop putting myself at the core and center of the universe. All the conflicting and this is why part of this one ayah, in, especially in Sufi literature, you know, you find tons of stuff written about the whole image of two hearts and a chest and the whole track of disciplining the ego was you know, it, right in the center of a lot of these discourses is this concept that you find at the beginning of Surah Al-Ahzab. But for us, what is important is that if the Prophet والسلام, himself, the Prophet, is told, purify your resolve, Purify your determination. Make sure 
that you are not of two hearts on this matter a priori imagine how it applies to us but then what does the Quran choose to say this about the problem of the heart so the, the if you notice this is verse 4 so first it starts God did not endow any human with two hearts in their chest. Okay. And then it continues on. And just as God has not made your wives whom you have declared to be as unlawful to you as your mothers, truly your mothers, so too God never made your adopted sons, truly your sons. These are but figures of speech. This is Muhammad Asad's translations. Figures of speech uttered by your mouth. Uh, we'll come to that. Whereas God speaks the absolute truth, and it is God alone who can show you the right path. Okay. So, here is this issue of the heart. What's significant right away is that we say, well, wait, the issue of the heart was already dealt with in Surah Al Mujadala. And the fact that Surah Al Ahzab revealed after Al Mujadala comes back to it tells you what? It tells you that it remained con 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 persisted as a problem in society. It's one thing for God to come and say, don't do it, but do people actually relent and stop doing it if it's an embedded cultural practice? So, and remember what the heart is, it's not just that you're telling your wife you're like the back of my mother to me, but once you say that, she, according to pre-Islamic custom, she is neither your wife nor able to go marry someone else. She becomes a mu'allaqa, she becomes stuck. So it's as an institution, as a practice, it's very unfair to women. Um, but it persisted. And in one full swoop, Allah comes and says, well, the reason it persists is because your wills are not purified. It's as if you're exactly like the munafiqun, or you are a part of nifaq. You yourself, you are a hypocrite by saying you believe, but continuing with the practice that God has already banned. Now, you can imagine that there were plenty of people who thought of themselves as good Muslims, but perhaps didn't think it was a big deal that they continued a cultural practice even if it was banned, or you know, didn't, didn't self-categorize. And we see this persistently, that many individuals would resist categorizing themselves or describing themselves as hypocrites. But it is their behavior that would in fact categorize them as hypocrites. And so the judgment of history, although they would, you know, they, they attended prayer in the mosque, they would be there in the meetings, they would often, some of them even, some of them even transmitted hadith. But yet, 
we have other hadiths that would name these individuals as among the hypocrites. So the category of hypocrisy itself is not as our, you know, we, we imagined history to be or invented history to be as if it was, you know, uh, just evil people who were planning to do away with the prophet night and day. It was people who often struggled with their, com their commitment to Islam in the same way that you and I struggle with our commitment to Islam. And that's why they were hypocrites. It's the type of struggle. So those who continue to practice zihar, but here, a very important point is you construct reality in the same way that you construct the institution of zihar by imagining that your wife could become like your mother. You can also imagine that such and such has become your child. In other words, overlook biological lineage and attempt to reimagine and reconstruct relationships. And we know that the Quran, and this is a very big topic, but it's uh, that the Quran consistently advises us to remain as close to nature as possible. That تغيير خلق الله, changing Allah's creation, is a slippery slope. It's a very dangerous path to go down. This is a, that we look at creation as a Quran, and in the same way that you don't just change the Quran, you don't just fool around with the Quran of creation. And so, yes, it might be for a variety of reasons useful for you to say, well, this person is the child of that person. Well, the water. Okay. I, I don't know what the, the nature of the devil attack is, but there's a devil attack and it's messing up things and I just was told to continue so I will continue whatever Bismillah rahman rahim okay so this is this concept of what reality you construct is really important because we notice something in Surah Al-Ahzab and um, remarkably, it's 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 something that he, in the tafsir it was not noticed for some reason, but that at the that right when Allah is telling us that when you claim your wives are your mothers, that's impermissible. When you claim that children that are not your biological children are, you give them your names as if they are your bi biological children. By extension, this is uh, this also, um, like in Western societies, there's this practice of terminating parental rights. There, there, this happens all too often where the state will terminate the parental rights of parents and of course it's usually the state does that with minorities with um ethnic and racial minorities that are usually victimized by this and then takes their children and puts them up for adoption but anyway as surat al-ahzab 
told us be be on notice that when you when when you take God's creation and you are reinventing and reconstructing that that's impermissible right let's see right after that right in the verses that follow that Allah presents a constructed category. Look, and Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummuhatihim. So, right after telling you that, Allah comes in and says, Well, the Prophet has a special place. And we'll talk about that place in a second. And the wives of the Prophet are the believer's mothers. And so if you're paying attention, you say, we have a juxtaposition here. The relationships as reinvented by human beings are invalid. But the relationship as invented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is valid. And the juxtaposition is between inventing something related to adoption versus Allah telling us that the wives of the Prophet are the mothers of the believers. And as we will see, this is actually quite important to the entire thrust of the message of Surah Al-Ahzab. To skip ahead so you get, get it because this is not a point that you will find so it, it, it to, to solidify it, if you will. That when you get to, eventually we get to the point of the amana, that trust that God gives. If you understand your place vis-a-vis -vis this creation, if you truly believe to the point that the reality as presented to you by God becomes your reality. Because it's as if Allah is saying you will always have a choice. You can invent reality as you see fit. But Allah knows that as we will see in the battle of the trench itself, it requires a resolve, a strength, a conviction to commit yourself to the reality as God tells you it is. And that's the type of resolve that's difficult to come by. And that reality is going to include the role of the Prophet as a Siraj Munir, as, a, as an illumination for humanity. And even our relationship to life and death, and our relationship to danger and crises. It's like, All this Quran has consistently told you, reorient your psychology from the temporal to the eternal. Repeatedly, Allah has told you, this life on earth is not as meaningful as you think it is, that the real life is a hereafter. But then Allah comes 
at an applied example, a real living example of people that have received the law and continue to stick to the continue to stick to their old ways out of habit not even necessarily out of defiance but out of habit that a practice of zihar is just anchored culturally and then the other where it would make rational sense for human beings to and and even to the as we will see even to the discretion of the prophet himself to imagine having a son that is not his son to allah come and say well if you are true believers your psychology will accept what allah tells you is the reality that you surrender to, that you defer to, rather than the reality that your other heart, that Allah is, declares um, illegitimate, the other heart in your chest tells you that you should surrender to. Okay, so now, Typically, when we talk about the, the, the first, about especially the, the very first ayat, four and five, that where Allah says, with these adopted children, ud'uhum li'aba'ihim, you can it is you can adopt but you cannot change their names you can take care of orphans and in fact what allah describes and i wish this institution would have survived into modernity it's like among the other things that muslims uh lost that and that they are your mawali wa ikhwanukum fi din that they are in fact you are mawali is is like your um how does muhammad asad describe it um uh, translate um and oh he just he just translates it as call them your brethren in faith and your friends mawali i mean it's it's too literal friends is too literal um Mawali is is a special relationship that has numerous legal connotations and moral connotations. So if I am if if I am your mawla and you are my mawla, it means that I am there is a bond between us, a bond witnessed by God honored by God and a bond a commitment that I stand by you and you stand by me and I help you in all your affairs and you will help me in all my affairs and so when Allah comes and says they are your mawali and they are your brethren you go you do everything possible to not make these people feel marginalized in society in fact the 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 the, the moral command is for full integration by the ethics of the quran to create orphanages where you put orphans in is is not it, it is a violation of the notion of mawali and your brethren in, in religion they belong in your homes if if you have a truly moral islamic society 
there would be no orphans and orphanages. They, and they would belong in your homes and they would be treated as fully, as full members of your family. And in fact, as a maula, they would have a special status of especially honored position in your family. You go out of your way to make sure that your maula is your obligations toward your towards your maula is are discharged while you know it, you might think that your children might forgive you for you know failing to deliver on this or failing to live but your maula is like you know like having honored guests but they're long-term guests you 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 can't it's it's a considered highly dishonorable to cut corners with your maula so they would have full status, but it would remain clear that they come so that it never becomes acceptable for people to simply discard their blood. So it becomes clear they come from this family and it will always be known that this family didn't take care of its offspring. And so they had to become... And if you don't know... Now, if you don't know who, what their lineage is, then whatever institutions you create must not single them out or make them feel inferior. Because, again, Allah says... They are your brethren and your mawali. They are your charge. They are your obligation. Now, typically, you read that this is all the center of this revelation is because of Zayd bin Haritha. So, Zayd is the, the origins of Zayd. By the way, there, there's there's again conflicting reports with whether he was purchased by Khadija and given as a gift to her husband, or whether Zayd was purchased by the Prophet directly. But, but this is long before the beginning of the prophecy of uh, the Prophet ﷺ. So this is, you know, before uh, the Prophet is a prophet. And Zayd bin Haritha Kelbi, so we, we know where he, what tribe he comes from. He is from, in fact, uh, uh, from, the, from the clan of Shirhabil and from the tribe of El- Ben Kulayb, so he's a Kelbi, but Zayd bin Haritha was among the, the children that was in the tribal wars among Arabs, was captured and sold into slavery. And whether he's given as a gift by Khadija or what, but he ends up with the Prophet when he's quite young. And the prophet loves him as his own. He raises him. And he frees him and raises him as his own and gives him his name. So he's known as Zayd ibn Muhammad, Muhammad's son. Now, being known, notice, and this is sort of a, something to just reflect on. It's not, it's not in the text of Surah Al-Ahzab. But in Surah Al-Ahzab, as we will see, Allah comes and says, Muhammad is not the father of any of your children. And we know 
that one of the toughest, most severe tests that the Prophet ﷺ is exposed to is every time he had a male child, that male child didn't survive. Whether a Qasim or Ibrahim or so on. They, every male child, they die very young. And of course, it breaks the Prophet's heart. Like all human beings, he, he really wants, a, a, and especially as an Arab, he wants a male heir, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala denies him a male heir. Now, Surah Al-Ahzab is also where Allah says that the, this is the Prophet Khatamun Nabiyin, which can be translated as the seal of the prophets and the final prophet. We know that the lineage of previous prophets would lead, the male lineage of previous prophets would eventually lead to the continuation of prophecy. So the lineage of Ibrahim, the lineage of Musa, the lineage of Isa. Well, Isa, of course, you know, didn't have a father, so didn't have lineage. But anyway, Musa and Ibrahim and Noah and so on. But this is the final prophet. And there is no further prophecy in the lineage. But the tendency of human beings is that if I know that this is the, your son, the tendency is that I will continue treating your son as if they've inherited the message from you. So we know that there are rational reasons. First, Allah made sure that the Prophet ﷺ doesn't have male heirs. And every male the Prophet conceived ended up dying. We know that Allah says it is intentional that the Prophet is not the father of all, any of your children. You collectively as an ummah are the inheritors of this faith. There is a special place for Ali al-Bayt, which we'll talk about, but it is Ali al-Bayt in a very specific sense, but no one will adopt the role of the inheritor of the prophet by lineage. And people, when Zayd ibn Muhammad, when Surat al-Ahzab is revealed, Zayd ibn Muhammad, Allah, it, explicitly instructs the Prophet that no longer can you call him Zayd ibn Muhammad. He has to be known by his actual lineage as Zayd ibn Haritha. Well, did this affect Zayd? Absolutely. It bothered him. But look at the, the just the layers in Surah Al-Ahzab. But Allah honored Zayd, Zayd in a way that gave him a consolation that he carried with pride till the day he died. And that is, he was among the extremely few explicitly named in the Quran. And Zayd would say that as much as not being known as Ibn Muhammad broke my heart, as much as it was 
compensated for or it would lifted my spirits much more so that I was named in the Quran for people forever to, to read Zaid's name in Surah al ahzab This is just like a, a side note of if, if Allah takes care of the emotions and feelings of human beings to this extent, how about us? If Allah consoles human beings like this, everything in the Quran is an educator. And the fact that Allah just doesn't just slap you in the face and say, oh, get lost, you know, this is the way it is. But actually, with those who are decent, consoles them, supports them, aids them, as, and as we will see also another example, Surah Ahzab. So anyway, now, there is however an issue is because Zaid was a slave, freed slave, the Prophet ﷺ is keenly aware that there is an enormous amount of resistance in Arab society to treating freed slaves as equals. And so when a freed slave wants to marry a free woman, a free woman says, that's beneath me. The Prophet's cousin, Zainab, is someone that he grew up with. And this will become um, an important point that I'll, I'll talk about in, in a little bit. Now, this is the same woman who uh, reportedly Aisha told us as, or reportedly told us that she was so beautiful, a um, woman of great beauty. Of course, I'm, I'm saying this a little bit, with a little bit of skepticism because uh, Aisha seemed to think everyone, every woman that the Prophet uh, might look at was so beautiful, or she always describes them as very beautiful. Allahu A'lam, who cares? I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a material point. Anyway, but so there are even reports that Zainab was always in love with the Prophet والسلام, although she never tells him. Whether, you know, I, I tried to look into these reports and find out if they're, uh, you know, I don't know, Allah Adam. I mean, I couldn't get anywhere as to whether they're, they're reliable or not reliable. Um, it, it reportedly, Zainab herself says, I, I have always been in love with Muhammad ever since we were children, and um, uh, and this is communicated in the context of of bragging about the fact that Zainab would say, "I am the only woman whose marriage to the Prophet came from the seven heavens." Means Allah commanded the Prophet. To marry me, um, and we'll get to that. I'll, I'll we'll get to the details about that. But she's very proud of the fact that that uh, in in her view that Allah, it, her the command to marry her came from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Um, and she says, "Well, I you know at least in one." report she says uh, and and 
I've always been. Now, the reason I'm, is that we have that same report about her bragging that she's the only woman that Allah commanded the Prophet to marry, but without the the addition that I have always been in love with him. So, Allahu alam. Anyway. So, the Prophet ﷺ goes to Zainab and intently to make a point about the position of freed slaves tells her to marry Zaid bin Harissa. After all, he raised Zaid and he says, I know Zaid. He is a very good person, a very decent person. And there is even a, a tradition that Zainab Malakat Amraha Lil Nabi. That what this means is among the institutions of marriage is that a woman could go to a family member and say, I deputize you, it's like a, 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 a contract of agency, to marry me to who you see fit. That's known as tamlik. So anyway, the Prophet ﷺ goes to her uh, and, and he doesn't just enter you know, a contract for her between her and, and Zaidi, but he tells her, this is the person I should think you marry. And Zainab thinks Zaid is beneath her because he's a freed slave. And she refuses and says, no, I don't want to marry him. And the Prophet ﷺ keeps urging her to do so, and she resists. Eventually, she caves in. And we will see, th this comes to a very important point, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going a, a little bit, skipping a little bit ahead, because Surat Al-Ahzab is difficult to present if I just go in the order of the ayat. So just bear with me. It, it you know it's like it's like a painting P putting all the pieces and then it will all come together inshallah so the prophet sallam keeps urging her she eventually caves in and says okay fine you know i that you know i i've i've put it in your hands anyway so okay fine Now, this will become an important point. Why? Because there is a verse in Surah Al-Ahzab that says, when the Prophet commands something, those who obey immediately. And this is a big point in the tradition. Why? Did the Prophet, والسلام, order Zainab to marry Zayd because that has implications as to the freedom of a woman to engage in her own contract. Did he order her or did he urge her? And if the Prophet urged her, not ordered her, then why does it say that, and in fact, let's... Uh, Um, I'm trying to, to, to remember it and I'm blocking up. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا This is verse 36 Whenever God and God's apostle has decided the matter is not for a believing man or a believing woman to claim freedom of choice insofar as they themselves are concerned for he who thus rebels against God and Apostle has already most obviously gone astray. Notice that this verse 36, and we'll come to that, we'll come to that, because I'm just skipping ahead for now, is structurally not where Allah talks about the issue of Zaid, but much later in the surah. Yet, most of the commentators of the Quran tell you that verse 36 is about Zainab's marriage to Zayd. And that what Allah is saying is that because the Prophet wanted Zainab to marry Zayd, she should have not had a choice. As we will see, this is clearly wrong. It completely misses the point. We'll come to that, but I just want to flag this now. That the Prophet ﷺ did not command Zainab to marry Zayd, but urged her. Finally, she gave in. But Zainab's attitude towards Zayd never got better. Now, is it because she was always in love with the Prophet, or is it because he was a freed slave, where according to Zayd, it was because he was a freed slave? And he consistently complains to the Prophet ﷺ that she's not nice to him, that she's arrogant with him, that she speaks as if she's done him a favor when she married him. He doesn't like that. And he eventually is so fed up with it that he tells the Prophet, I'm done. I can't put up with this anymore. And Now, if verse 36, as a lot of commentators say, was actually was truly about marriage, then you would have said, well, if it applies to Zainab marrying Zaid, then it would also apply to Zaid remaining married to Zainab. Because the Prophet, ﷺ, when he tells him, when Zayd tells the Prophet, I want to divorce her. The Prophet says, what? Don't divorce her. But you see, here's where you see this gender bias, the misogyny. All the Quranic commentators said, well, this verse 36 applies to Zainab marrying Zayd that she should have just obeyed. But it doesn't apply to Zaid divorcing Zainab. You can't have it both ways. And as I'll show you, inshallah, that in fact they completely missed the point about verse 36. Keep that in mind. Inshallah, we'll get to it. Okay. So let's go back again to the chronology of the verses. We understand that although the Prophet adopted Zayd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes in and says, no, you, you can have them as a mawla. In fact, they are your brethren. You take care of them, but you keep lineage clear. Now, at the same time, 
Allah comes in and says that an nabiyu awla bil mu'nina min anfusihim. Now, wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum. So, comes and reconstructs the nature of relationship in a profound way because Allah says when it comes to the Prophet vis-a-vis his community in fact the Prophet has a higher claim the Prophet is your best interest is the Prophet's concern and charge even more than you yourself Now, so let's take this part first. One of the earliest Quranic authorities, Mujahid, says that this revelation was understood because we, 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 we want to think about how did the earliest authorities understood what the Quran was talking about. And Mujahid tells us that every prophet was a father to their ummah. And that all the biblical prophets were spoken about as fathers to their people. And Mujahid says that similarly with this revelation, it was underscored that the Prophet Muhammad was the father of the believers. And because of that, the believers are brethren. وَصَارَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ أُخْوَةً لِأَنَّ النَّبِيِّ أَبُوهُمْ فِي الدِّينِ Ibn Mas'ud similarly tells us that the way this was understood is that they should think of the Prophet ﷺ as their father. And hence, since the Prophet ﷺ is their fathers, they are now brethren. All the authorities, Ibn Abbas also says something very similar. In this context, when the Prophet is explaining this verse, he says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من نفسه وماله وولده والناس أجمعين that you are actually not real believers until I become dearer to you than yourself, your money, and your children, and all people. You must pause at this because this is going to become really important to the entire message of Surah Al-Ahzab and say, I must develop an intimacy with the Prophet ﷺ where it's not that I am blindly imitating the Prophet. It is not that the Prophet is just a historical figure. But I must actually love the Prophet more than I love myself. And it is fair then to say, why? Why should I love the Prophet more than I love myself and love my parents and love my children and love my money? What is the point of that? And is it fair to ask us to love a historical figure that we only know through reports and traditions.
So we'll come back to this point. Just don't forget we raise these questions. The second point is that now the wives of the prophets are as if your mothers. وَأُولُوا الْأَرْحَامِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلَى بِبَعْضٍ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ إِلَّا أَنْ تَفْعَلُوا إِلَى أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ مَعْرُوفًا كَانَ ذَلِكَ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَصْدُورًا So this is, I'm reading 6. So then it goes on say after and their wives are the mothers and they who are thus closely related have in accordance with God's decree a higher claim upon one another than even the case between the believers of Yathrib, the Ansar, and those who have migrated and Muhajirin. There for the sake of God, nonetheless you are to act with utmost kindness or utmost goodness towards other close friends as well. This is written down in God's decree. This phrase. So the prophet has a very special status. And as the early interpreters said, in fact, and as the Prophet's hadith explains, a truly unique and singular status. And the wives are mothers of the believers and must be treated as mothers of the believers. But Beyond that, now we know that when the Ansar, when the Muhajirun, the migrants came to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ invented an institution of al muakha where he would say, you and you are brothers, you and you are sisters. And that in their eagerness to be good Muslims, they would treat each others like brothers so much so that they would even sometimes inherit one another. The Quran came in to say the same theme that while Allah can invent these categories, you can't. And even if it is between the migrants and the natives, yes, mu'akha is a relationship of goodness, commitment and goodness. But you must always be clear that it doesn't change the biological relationships that Allah created. So in other words, you cannot inherit from each other. Inheritance has to go according to the laws that God set out for us already in Surah An-Nisa. And moral good has to be pursued in its own right, but not through the reinvention of the Quran, the Quran of creation, as we will see. Okay, now there is a little thing about this phrase: "Illa an tafalu illa awliyakum marufa." So we know that. The Ansar and the Muhajirin, the migrants and the natives are awliya. They they have this relationship of wala. But there is a very 
early juristic debate, for instance, we find it in the opinions of the very early opinions of Ibn al-Hanafiya, from who said that this phrase meant one of the surprising and you know very early positions in Islamic law that it meant that when it is permissible in writing a will to leave shares to Christians and Jews, that Christians and Jews can be part of your relationship of wala for the purposes of leaving share them shares in inheritance laws as long as it doesn't violate the shares of biological relationships. That, you know, later Islamic law, it became a different story. Okay. So, and then Allah reminds us that our relationship to this prophet and the relationship of this prophet to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is anchored in a mithaq, in a covenant, the same type of covenant that Allah in a mithaq khaliz, in a, in a most serious and solemn covenant. Interestingly, it's also the same, it, Allah describes the covenant of a marriage as a mithaq ghaliz as well. But the same type of covenant that was taken from the prophets Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa, this is verse 7. And for you to understand that the position of this prophet amongst you and the prophet's relationship to you is per this covenant, most solemn and serious covenant, is why لِيَسْأَلَ الصَّادِقِينَ عَنْ صِدْقِهِمْ وَعَدَّ لِكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا so that, this is eight, so that to ask so that we, we hold the true, as are the truthful. The, 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 the as sadiqin is like Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr is known as Abu Bakr as siddiq meaning the, the, the most pristine, the most pure, the most truthful, so that Allah will ultimately, it's like saying, so that Allah will ultimately test the most truthful amongst you and obviously punish those who are not up to par. Okay. So, if you are reading Al Ahzab carefully, you'd say, okay, wait. So, we started with a message to the Prophet take what you're doing very seriously. And know that human beings suffer from an enormous amount of inconsistency, paradoxes, conflicting emotions and commitments because human beings act as if 
They have two hearts, but this pass, if the, the, the truth of this pass is represented in Allah's truth, and Allah's truth, you, Muhammad, like other prophets, are at the center of it, and your role is central to it. And all of this is necessary to distill those who are truly with Allah, those who are truly sadiqeen. from the others. And this is an introduction to the events of the trench. So you tell yourself, okay, so when we get now to understanding the trench, how is this introduction going to help me sift through the events of the battle of the trench? How is it gonna help me analyze what Allah tells us about the battle of the trench. What time is it? Nine. Nine? Okay. So it's nine o'clock. I'm going to uh, uh, go about to, may, not maybe not fully 9.30, but uh, I will set up the battle of the trench. Um, and And leave the rest to inshallah till Saturday. Okay. So we have talked about, remember that we just talked about in Surah Al-Hash and Surah Al-Nur the fact that there is an enormous amount. This society, these people, are under an enormous amount of pressure and an enormous amount of stress and an enormous amount of anxiety, and they are being tested. Now, look at the description in the Quran of this test now. So it's like saying, you thought you had it bad? Well, look at this test that now you have been exposed to. This is uh, verse 9. All you who have believed, or believers, remember the blessings which God bestowed upon you when the enemy hosts came down upon you whereupon God let loose against them a storm wind and heavenly host that you would not see yet God saw all that you did remember what you felt when they came upon you from above and from below and when your eyes became dim and your hearts came up to your throats and when most conflicting thoughts about God's passed through your minds and for there and then were the believers tried and shaken with a shock most severe and remember how it was when the hypocrites and those whose hearts diseased said to one another God and God's apostle have promised us nothing but delusions and lies. And when some of them said, O people of Yathrib, you cannot withstand the enemy. Go back to your homes. 
Whereupon a party from among you asked leave of the Prophet, saying, Behold, our houses are exposed to attack. The while they were not really exposed, they wanted nothing but to flee. So, first, Quraysh brought together numerous tribes. They brought from Najd, for instance, the tribe of Ghatafan, under the leadership of Aina bin Hassan. They brought the tribe of Hawazin. They marshaled from the, and they came from east and west, so they sandwiched Medina. From as the Quran puts it, from above and from below. And Quraysh came with a number of allies of clans around Quraysh. allied with the Jews of Banu Nadir. Now remember, these were the Jew this is, was the Jewish tribe that was expelled from Medina. But yet, several of the elements that were expelled and went to Khaybar joined the forces against, although they had promised when they were expelled that they would not fight Muslims anymore, they broke their promise and joined the alliance. So, literally Medina was surrounded from above and below, from all sides, there is no escape, by overwhelming tribal forces. An alliance Arabia had not seen since about 50 years earlier. I mean, that was the last time that Arabia had managed to be allied in anything. Now, what was even worse, now that the Prophet ﷺ learned that The tribe of Banu Khuraiza, which was, was inside of Medina, promised to give the invading forces access through their territory and to join their forces. What is remarkable is that we don't have a single report that says Allah told the Prophet about these forces that have been amassed to invade Medina. How did the Prophet find out his intelligence forces? So, look, this is a Prophet. Has most solemn covenant with God but doesn't sit there and rely on God to provide them with information but has a sophisticated enough intelligence network to, have, to find out about the alliance to eventually find out about the day of the invasion D-Day and to find out about the betrayal of Banu Khuraiza, leave alone the betrayal of Banu Nadir, re-betrayal for the millionth time of Banu Nadir. And there is just logically, if the, you go out 
to meet these forces somewhere to try to intercept them in the battlefield, you've left Medina to be outflanked by Banu Khuraiza. The reason you couldn't go out with your forces to intercept the invading is because the betrayal is right in the backyard. So you have to keep your forces close to home. That's the only hope that you have of actually, so you couldn't do what the Prophet did with Uhud, have Shura, should we go intercept or should we stay at home? This time, the betrayal of Banu Qurayza foreclosed that possibility. So as we know that Salman and Pharisee tells the Prophet ﷺ that how about the idea of digging a trench, which Arabs did not know but was practiced in Persia. And again, you pause at the fact that this was not a man who's just saying, you know, Allah will take care of it. But the Prophet ﷺ says, this is a good idea, let's do it. But the time they have to dig the trench is very limited, no more than three days. And so they need all hands on and they need to work extremely fast, night and day, digging a trench. And they say, well, we can't dig a trench around the entire of Medina, but we can do, what we can do is dig a trench where in the back of us is the mountain of Sahel. So if they try to invade through the mountain, it's rugged enough that we can engage them. And in front of us is the trench. And they can't access Medina unless they literally flank around the trench, but then we will see them flanking. And we can fight them. The only way they can outflank us is through Banu Qurayza. So Muslims are forced to divide their forces a group protects the mountain of Sahel and a group has to prevent the invasion through the territory of Bani Khuraiza and the rest have to vigilantly protect the trench to prevent a crossing or a flanking around the trench to get at Medina <clears throat> so a longer route. But, and the Prophet ﷺ sets up his headquarters at the foot of that, that mountain, Sahel, and Hassan ibn Thabit has a home. His house was right next to that mountain. So Al al Bayt, the, the Prophet moves all the his wives and children to the house of Hassan ibn Thabit. And they advise the people of Medina to move all their families to help the army protect a smaller territory, to move all their wives and children in encampments between the trench and the mountain of Seh. Okay? The problem though is this is a real test of faith. Many people are already demoralized and think 
this is a losing battle. There is no way that we're going to win this battle. And in a move that must have created an enormous anxiety for the defenders, many of them refused to move their families to encampments. So, because the greater the territory you have to protect, the more you spread out your army is. They left their families in their homesteads. And as digging the trench became more and more exhausting, and as the army of the Confederates appeared, it also got windy and very cold. And the defenders became extremely exhausted. So what started happen, happening, more and more those people who did not move their families would come to the Prophet ﷺ and say, we are worried about the safety of our families. We need to be with them to protect them. Can you please excuse us? And every person that asked for such permission, the Prophet ﷺ gave it said go we didn't say anything more just okay go now by going means you're not at the front line you're not protecting the trench you're not protecting against Ben Qurayza you're not protecting Sahel you have turned this into an individualistic private endeavor you're protecting your own And the Prophet ﷺ knows that these people are effectively saying this is a losing battle. Let us go and tell when when Muslims, when it's all gone, Muslims are defeated, then we can say, well, look, we didn't fight against you. We were at home. Don't, you know, don't count us, don't count this against us because we weren't at the trench. Some reports say that those who kept withdrawing kept going, basically going home, back home. The depletion was such that all those that actually remained with the Prophet ﷺ was no more than 300 people. Now, whether it's true 300 or 600, it's still the majority of the army chickened out and freaked out and gave up exhausted, tired, hungry, demoralized. And that's why the Quranic description وَإِذْ ذَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ وَبَلَغَتُ قُلُوبَ الْحَنَاجِرِ As if Allah comments and says, Allah has seen how your eyes started looking around in terror and your throats, uh, your hearts, as if they became lumps in your throats. Absolute terror, absolute fear. And as a result, you thought you're being so smart by going and telling the Prophet, can we go please excuse to because we need to protect our family. And the Prophet consistently would say, okay, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to shame you. I'm not going to say, where is your faith? Where is your iman? Where is this? Where is that? I'm not going to say any of that. I'm just going to say, okay, go. This is the style of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is not going to chase after you to be to do what's right. 
What's right, it's clear. If you are vigilant with yourself, in the same way that there are three or six hundred or 650 by some estimates that did the right thing and remained standing despite the hunger, despite the exhaustion, despite the cold. But the rest of you made excuses and went back home to be warm where there's a, a bed, your family, a comfort, and distancing yourself from the events. And as the hypocrites, إذ يقول المنافقون والذين في قلوب قلوبهم مرض ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا. What are they say? It's saying. Oh my God, it's all a lie. The prophet is a lie. The promise is a lie. This whole plan was a lie. It's all done. وَإِذْ قَالَتْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ يَا أَهْلَ يَسْرِبْ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ فَارْجِعُوا وَيَسْتَأْذِنُ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ النَّبِيُّ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّ بِيُوتَنَا عَوْرَ وَمَا هِيَا بِعَوْرَ إِنْ يُرُجُونَ إِلَّا فَرَارَ so they started telling the natives, especially among the, the natives, saying, okay, let's just go back home and sit and pretend. So maybe when the Confederates do win the battle, we'll say, we, we, we you know, please forgive us. We weren't at the trench. And as we said, ask permission from the, for the Prophet to withdraw. Then, وَلَوْ دُخِلَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ أَقْطَارِهَا ثُمَّ سُؤِلُوا الْفِتْنَةِ لَأَتُوهَا وَمَا تَلَبَّثُوا بِهَا إِلَّا يَسِيرًا So, even more, now, if their town would have been stormed, as they expected was going to happen, and the enemy would have come to them and said, now commit apostasy. Allah says, you would have done it. Yes, you are lying to yourselves after the fact. You're saying, no, 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 we would have stayed Muslim. But Allah knows that this is BS. If there was a defeat and your town would have been stormed, you would have, in fact, not put up any resistance and you would have apostated. And you would have pretended to regret ever having followed the Prophet Although, although, وَلَقَدْ كَانُوا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهِ مِنْ قَبْلِ لَا يُوَلُّونَ الْأَدْبَارِ وَكَانَ الْعَهْدُ اللَّهِ مَسْئُولًا Although you promised that you are going to do the right thing and that you are not going to run away. And although God remembers the promises and will hold you accountable to what you said and promised, Allah knows your promises are worth nothing. Indeed, كُلَّنْ يَنْفَعْكُمُ الْفِرَارِ إِنْ فَرَارْتُمْ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ أَوْ الْقَتْلِ وَإِذًا لَا تُمَتَّعُونَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا In fact, who's, which way, who's going to escape death? Even if you escape death, you will only last for a short period of time enjoying your time on this earth. And who... من ذا الذي يعصمكم من الله who, who would protect you from if Allah wanted harm to occur to you or wanted good to occur to you 
despite all of that, or despite all of these logical contingencies, Allah knows, Allah knows, قَدْ يَعْلَمُ اللَّهُ الْمُعَوَّقِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَالْقَائِلِينَ لِإِخْوَانِهِمْ هَلُمَّ إِلَيْنَا وَلَا يَأْتُونَ الْبَأْسَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Allah knows, the truth of the matter is, God is indeed aware, those of you, who are started diverting, started encouraging others to withdraw. It's, that's the nature of when people do wrong. They never want to just do wrong alone. They want companionship in being wrong. They want to be validated in being wrong. So Allah knows that you started turning to each other and saying, come on, let's, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Let's run away. This is what Allah describes as a muawwaqin, those who... Mawqin literally means obstructionists. Those who diverted others. So, and in fact, all your talk about perseverance and how you're this and it's, it's nonsense. You are weak and you are not willing to sacrifice for a principle. In fact, look at this description. Ashihatan alaikum. Faida ja al khawfur aitam yanzuruna ilaik taduru ayunum kaladi yuksha alayhim in al mout. Faida zahab al khawf salakukum be elitsinat in hidad. Ashihatan ala al khayr. Ula ikalam yu minu. Fa ahbat Allah amalahum. Wakana zalika ala Allah yasira. In fact, this is 19. In fact, these people, when you look into their hearts, they are people that begrudge help. They're not generous people. They're not giving people. They're people that look after number one, themselves. They begrudge you help. And in fact, when there's fear and threat, they look at you with their eyes rolling in terror. It's like eyes literally when eyes are trembling in fear. And as if they are seeing death. But the minute Allah removes the state of terror. What is their attitude? What is their psychology? Sharp tongues. They're not, they're begrudging in good. Remember when we encountered before, when Allah describes those who do good without begrudging what they do. We come again here that the, the, the state is that they begrudge the good they do. If they do good at all. And they have sharp tongues. They're very good at criticism. But you look at their behavior while they speak very critically of others of those who actually sacrifice everything for the cause, they themselves are far from the standard that they seem to uphold with their words. Now, we'll continue with this, inshallah, on Saturday, because we're not entirely done with the Battle of the Trench, but so, those who went through the entire agony and stuck it through are not the majority. But Allah uses this opportunity to expose 
the majority to themselves and say, you don't think of yourself as hypocrites, but you are. You think that just because the prophet gave you, said, okay, go, that you're in the safe. This is worse than what you did with Aisha. This is worse than what you did with Uhud. But even more, more of you were implicated in this than either Uhud or what you did with Aisha. And although after the battle, this is really critical point, although after the Confederates withdrew, well, I'm here to tell you that the Confederates withdrew because Allah stepped in and Allah specifically says that the Ahzab were defeated by Allah after Allah saw the sacrifice of those who sacrificed, the perseverance of those who persevered. But as the story goes, is that Allah sends a storm. Now, the storm by itself wouldn't have done the job, but the Confederates, every time they tried to come through the territory of Banu Quraiza, they found Muslims putting up a very stiff resistance. Every time they tried to cross the trench, they found Muslims putting up very stiff resistance. And then after being stuck, they said, okay, well, let's do a long-term siege of Medina. They will run out of provisions and eventually we're going to just bleed them slowly. Allah sends a storm that completely demoralizes the Confederates and the breaks the alliance. Initially, by first, the Ghatafan says, the tribe of Ghatafan says, we're going back home, we, we, you know, making excuses, and once one tribe withdrew, the rest withdrew. The same people who withdrew from the battle came out and pretended to be, oh, well, you know, great, we did a great job. You know, you protected the trench and we protected Medina from the inside. And Allah comes and says, nonsense. You were cowards. You were liars. And you are hypocrites. And the way that Allah explains why they're hypocrites will leave that, or the way that Allah further explains why they're hypocrites will leave that, inshallah, till Saturday. Surat al-Ahzab is a, a, one of these sort that if you fully listen to what it's saying, it will demand that you look into a very deep introspective look into your relationship to God, to the Prophet and to your system of norms and ethics and morality. And what takes priority in your life? What ultimately holds the, the true authority in your life? We'll continue, inshallah, on Saturday. Uh, is, oh, Grace is here. Oh, why did I think she's not here? Um, oh, since Grace is here, then she can come do four more clothes.
Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, uh, what an amazing start. Um, I mean, all of what it took even just to set the stage so that we could understand, and especially the last part when you're explaining what people's attitudes were. I mean, you know, all of this makes it so clear that we could just as easily find a circumstance in our day and age that would perfectly address, like, the situation you know, we are demoralized, it's a test of faith, are we going to sacrifice, what do we really care about, what's important to us when we're really pushed out of our comfort zone, what are we really caring about, you know, do people recognize that when you leave the cause to go take care of yourself, you're leaving the cause of God to, like, fend for yourself, and then, you know, I mean, it's like the idea of you know, who are you really fooling and who are you lying to? Because God obviously knows what's in your heart and God knows you, whatever you tell yourself, God knows ultimately what the truth is and you can't really hide it. Um, I'm sure, you know, it's it's like, it's hard to, um, you know, and, and also like, you know, when it comes down to it, who who of us would stay? You know, and it's like that, it's like in Juma, you know, when in Surah Juma, when you were saying, okay, People are listening to the the prophet, you know, uh, peace be upon him, give his khutbah, and people are hearing the drumbeat of the caravan with bringing the food items, and you know, are you going to run and go get stuff for your family and leave the prophet, or are you going to stick it through? And you know, it just again, it, it like when you understand those things and you think about your own situation today, it's hard not to think that I don't know, you know, I don't know, like if I would have been the if I could have passed that test because if you were so demoralized and tested and just pushed beyond, you know, way beyond your comfort zone, what would you have done? Um, so, I mean, but it's, um, again, as you said, such a call to be truly introspective and honest and to understand what your relationship is and because God is so clear in the examples um, in, in the Quran. And again, this underscores how important this work is, like how you are so meticulous in giving us the details so that we actually as human beings can completely relate, you know, regardless of what time period we're in. Um, and, and this is what's, it's such a gift and such a blessing um, to, you know, to help us understand, you know, our, our, our book and, and what God is telling us and, and see that it comes alive for, for our day and age. Thank you so much. I am so excited to continue. Um, you've given us so much to reflect on between now and then. And um, inshallah, may Allah help us all to learn and internalize these lessons and, and help them, you know, allow us to grow from everything that you've been giving us. So thank you so much, Sheikh. And um, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you being with us. Um, we'll, I think I don't know what happened with how much we lost through that technology um, attack <laughs> but we will we will put the recording up as soon as possible so anyone who was on the live stream um, hopefully can can see the recording sooner rather than later and catch up thank you so much assalamu alaikum have a wonderful rest of the week and we'll see you friday inshallah assalamu alaikum